Well, hey everyone, good evening. Thank you for joining our marriage Q&A. We're so thankful that you're joining us. My name is Gabriel and I have the privilege to serve as one of the pastors here at Christ Fellowship. We just went through an incredible marriage series that we entitled For God Sake Fight, where we learned how to fight for our marriages. And today we're going to answer these questions that you guys submitted throughout this series and we're so excited to do so. But in order to have an incredible Q&A, you need a great panel. So I want them to quickly introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Abby Ape. That's my wife. My name is Gideon. I serve as one of the pastors here at Christ Fellowship. My name is Ashley Gritley. My name is Omar Gritley. That guy. My name is Linda Flores. And my name is Sammy Flores, and I serve as one of the pastors here. That's right. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate all of you. We know that it's late, but that you guys are joining us, so thank you. So uh, we got a lot of questions submitted from so many different couples around all of our campuses, uh, locally and globally as well. And so we're going to straight dive into Are you guys ready tonight? You, you guys go. ready to go? We're, we're going to so need the Lord's help Lord. before we Amen. do so. So we're going to pray. Uh, pastor, can you pray for us tonight? Is that all right? Sure. Let me yeah. pray for us. Lord, thank you. Father, for bringing us together uh, as a church, and uh, we know that marriage could be could bring one of the, the great joys of life, but also the, the hardest moments in our life. And so, Father, as we uh, attempt to answer these questions, uh, we understand, Lord, that there's a lot of complex issues behind them. But Father, give us a grace, O oh Lord, to be able to answer them in a way that honors you. And so, Lord, lead us now as we, as we discuss. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Appreciate you guys. Well, you guys ready to dive in? We're going to start uh, a lot of serious questions. And so we're going to start with a very serious one tonight. It's on the topic of toilet paper. <laughs> this is a legit question. Toilet paper. When it comes to toilet paper, over or under? What do, what do you guys have to say? Over. over. Next. Over. Over. <laughs> over. Standing up. <laughs> <laughs> oh. This guy. Not even putting back on the roll. <laughs> the, 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 the roll of paper standing up. No, oh, standing up. Standing up. Not, not, not you standing still, up. Hanging it over or under? <laughs> Got to decide. Standing what is up. it in the Gritley household? Uh, no, oh, over the top. Over, over. Yeah, I think so. Over, over. Over? over. I'm going to say over to not feel left out. W would anybody ever say under though? Like, why would you, why would anybody want to reach under and pull it? Like, it Because then sense. you could rip it the right way. No, I'm not going to, I'm not oh, going to. Okay. By the way, no. I saw the other day that the patent of the toilet paper is over. It's over. When it was filed for toilet paper, it's over. Well, now, now we know. There, there it's, we go. It's a real and, thing. And, and you know, we literally have started a fight in a bunch of households right now. <laughs> oh, I, I, absolutely. <laughs> People that. actually put it in the, like, if you have comments, put it put it somewhere. It's going to be great. It's over. Um, it's over. It's, it's over. We'll, we'll, we'll land it. It's over. Um, now, move, moving into it, really, um, you know, this series was so powerful. Um, we saw so many marriages be uh, hopefully restored, uh, starting to work through uh, the things that they've been struggling with. Um, and at the same time, there's some marriages that are also are, are still struggling. They have questions. And so I, I just wanted to start right into it. Uh, Pastor Sammy, Linda, I would love to start with you guys. You know, when it comes to uh, tough times in a marriage, you know, there's going to be difficult moments, uh, death in a family. Uh, there's going to be moments of infertility, financial issues. How do we survive through tough times, especially in the world that we live in today? Well, you know, one of the things that I thought of when I saw this uh, particular question is, is that um, when we start our journey with Christ, we're not promised uh, a life without difficulties and struggles, uh, but we're, we are promise that God will be with us. Joshua 1 9 says that that he will that we don't need to be afraid, but that God will be with us. In fact, when you when you look at the gospels, John 16:33 talks about um, that in this world we're gonna have trouble. So we know that we're gonna have difficult times in this world, but that I've overcome the world. And so God reminds us. And that also in this Christian journey that we're on, you know, God doesn't say that um that Again, we're not going to be going through difficult times, but what happens is, or or we don't decide on how God is going to perfect us because God is constantly trying to bring us to him, perfect our lives. And so we don't decide how that's going to happen. So what? So in our lives, when those difficulties come, I believe that God is going to use those 
difficult situations to help us to be more like him. In fact, I, I love what uh, 2 Corinthians tells us. It says that, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. And so God is gonna comfort us th through those difficult times. But that verse continues to go on and saying that the same comfort that God gives us He's going to help us as well. And so I think that's important. What, what do you think, Linda? Well, um, as I was uh, thinking about this question, during uh, difficult times like death and what you mentioned, people, I think, tend to um, get quiet and not talk and to kind of go into their own space and hold things in. But that's the worst thing you can do when you're a married couple. You need to communicate with each other. And, and by communicating, then... Uh, you're able to uh, walk that journey together and pray together and uh, discuss um, the future and what it's going to look like when you, as you're going through it and when you get through it. Um, and you can also, uh, as you're doing that journey together, I think you grow closer to the Lord as well. And so as you're growing closer to each other, you're also growing closer to the Lord. You know, Pastor Gabe, um, I think uh, in, in, in light of that same question, someone was asking for like specific, um, you know, practical steps on how to, to deal with that. And, and I think especially in today's society and world, we're going through, there, there's so much, um, outside forces that are pressuring us. And so practical, some practical things I think is to, uh, avoid uh, or at least monitor the amount of social media that you take in, because that can be a big distraction. Uh, I think surrounding yourself around people that also uh, believe like you. Being in a small group, I know I mentioned, I, I think you mentioned financial, how to go through some financial uh, struggles. Well, the small group that we actually are in now that we're leading started as a financial peace small group. And then we led it into a, in, into a regular small group now. But it's in those small groups where you can do the one another's of the Bible, where you can encourage one another, pray for one another, forgive one another. So that's super important. And then again, going through difficult times, uh, being able to, to stand strong during, during difficult uh, seasons, uh, sometimes mean, sometimes means that, that you have to, um, go against the flow. So knowing that when you stand up for things that maybe uh, others aren't standing for, you may be standing by yourself, but super important that we do that as well. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for, for answering that. You know, one of the things that couples fight about and struggle so much, I mean, we know that the two leading causes of, of divorce are uh, infidelity and also finances is such a big struggle and issue in our marriages fighting about financial things. And so Pastor Omar Ashley, you know, when it comes to finances in our marriage, um, not only are there struggles because maybe of income or outcome or whatever, but um, there's also struggles in agreeing, uh, what are we going to buy? What are we not going to buy? We're in debt, but we want to keep swiping the card. And so what would be your advice for those couples that are struggling with their finances in those areas? Well, I, I think, you know, I think the first step that I would encourage every married couple and, and even in marriage counseling, um, premarital marriage counseling is, uh, I, I think a good first step is to combine finances. I think what happens oftentimes is that people who marry, who get married, sometimes they, they stay with separate finances. But if you think about it, it's, it's so unnatural because, you know, when God, but when, when God brings them together, he declares them to be one flesh. So, so we're one flesh for everything, but we are, we, we're, we're separate in our finances. And so I think taking steps towards that is very healthy. If, if they're not, I, I think there's something that happens when you feel you're in together regarding your finances. Um, I know when we got married, the first thing is we, we combined our bank account, we combined everything because we're, we're in this together, right? Uh, second thing I would always encourage people is to make a budget. Uh, make a budget uh, where there's where both people could look at a budget and be, and be in agreement as to how you're going to structure your finances. Uh, I really encourage as you make your budget uh, to make sure that you're honoring God. Uh, number one, uh, you can't expect God to honor you and your finances and to lead you if you're not honoring him with giving back with your tithe and offerings. I think that's something very important. Um, not only so that you know that you're honoring God, you're right with God in that specific area, but also I think the fact that you're honoring the Lord in that area 
sets you in a mindset that you're, you're, you're simply good stewards of what God has given to you. You know, and I think it really changes the dynamic. Okay, God is entrusting us money. Let's be responsible with what he's given to us. Um, and so, you know, create a budget where there is enough margin for, to be generous. Uh, there's, there's margin for each other. Uh, you know, even though we have a budget, you know, in our budget, we have a certain amount that she can do what she wants to do, you know, buy the stuff that she wants that month. And I could buy whatever I want that month, but it's an agreed upon like, Hey, you know, you, you got your, 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 this amount to, to do whatever you, you want to buy for yourself. But really, I think when it comes to finances, we're, we're always talking to each other, you know, uh, whenever we're about to make a big expenditure on either side, like we talk with each other, we, we never, there's never a solo, like, oh, I'm doing this by myself. I'm doing that by myself. And then fight about, we, we're always in agreement with each other. And so it's almost, I think the most important thing is to be, to, to feel like we're, we're a team mm -hmm. and that we're doing things together and that we're honoring each other and that, we're not spending a lot of money on certain, on something, not because not only it dishonors God, but because you won't be mindful of the other person. Any other thoughts? Yeah, and I think one of the hardest things that couples face in combining finances really is that, you know, one person always wants, you know, you want to have control over your finances. Society tells us that we should, you know, maintain a certain level of income and you got to make sure that you're set up just in case something happens. And culturally, a lot of people are told that. So, I mean, one of the big things too is keep your finances between just you and your spouse, like not bringing your family into those conversations and those decisions as well. And that's um, a mistake that I think a lot of couples can make very early on because they've gotten advice from their mom or their dad for so long. But there also comes a point that sure, we agree, but there had to be, there had to come a moment where I, as a wife, I would say have somebody who makes the financial decisions and who really is the one managing the day in and day out and agree upon who that's going to be. And then the other person really has to take that submissive kind of approach and understanding where, yes, we're going to talk about things, but ultimately if a decision is made, like that decision is made and you trust that person. And so for us, like that is Omar. And when we make those decisions, ultimately, like the decision is his finally if we have a disagreement upon something. So you have to have one who has that submissive approach and one who is really kind of leading the charge. And I think that's where some couples have challenges. Love it. It's constant communication. Pastor, you're going to say something? No, I just wanted to say that uh, when Pastor Omar was saying that sometimes, you know, your spouse needs a bigger budget, I was getting nudged over here. <laughs> uh, affirmation over here. He's like, what are you talking about? $20 is good enough. No, I'm good. But yeah, yeah, I agree. All good, all good stuff. Hide the Amazon good. boxes. <laughs> well, yeah. I think uh, with with whether it's tough times and and finances, I think communication is is key. Uh, once, if you, I mean, if the couple is talking and communicating, we're not always going to agree on the same thing. But it, I mean, we, we got to remember we're always on the on the same team. You know, something that Ashley had said uh, about advice about mom and dad. Sometimes listening to that, sometimes. God bless, but our in-laws sometimes are still a part of our <laughs> of our marriage. When you know what Pastor Omar, you said that we're going to become one. It says in, in Scripture that man will leave father and mother, right? And so, Pastor Pastor Gideon and Abby, I, I want to ask you: How do couples? How should couples navigate that relationship and even sometimes that tension with in-laws and you know their desires for you? And and sometimes there's one spouse that still says, "Well, well, I was raised this way, and so I need to think." this oh i think i hit a button there right and, and so people ask this question so how how should they manage that tension in that relationship and that's a really good question i'm glad pastor omar brought up being one flesh so let's go back to scripture matthew 19 4 says haven't you read he replied that at the beginning the creator made them male and female and said for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two shall become one flesh so when it be when it comes to becoming one flesh, there really is no room for anybody else, right? It's God and your spouse. And that is how we are to join in our relationship in marriage. And so uh, what changes when it comes to our relationship with our parents is just that relationship. It, it just changes, right? It used to be the authoritative parent over the child. But once you become married, the daughter leaves the authority of the father, unites with the husband, and then the son leaves the authority of his father and becomes the head of the household. Yeah, so you see them, 
You actually see the concept in Genesis 2 about leave and cleave. And so that word cleave is like, it's the Hebrew word uh, that refers to, to like a gluing or cementing. It's like a strong bond between two, two different objects. And so it's often used throughout scripture when you're talking about gluing or cementing something together. And so this is the way that the Lord has intended for marriage to be, that there's a total commitment between the husband and the spouse and between the husband, or the wife and the spouse, wait, the wife and the husband, both of them, you know, you got what I'm saying. <laughs> the husband and the wife together and then yeah. in their relationship uh, uh, to God. And so there's this... Um, Example that I often use about the, like the triangle of trust, if you want to call it that, but like say if God is at the top of this triangle and he's unmoving, he doesn't change. Could you hold this, babe? Teamwork here. So there's a triangle, right? The Lord is here and this is the husband and this is the, 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 the wife. Um, and so it, and if, if we're supposed to relate to each other, how do we, how do we come closer to each other is by pursuing the Lord. So if the husband pursues the Lord, but the wife doesn't, there's still a chasm that exists between the husband and, and, the, and the wife. The opposite is true as well. If the wife pursues God, but the husband chooses not to, there's a chasm that exists here. But look what happens when the husband and the wife pursues God together. The best way I can say it, if, if there's like a gem tumbler, you know, if, if you if you know a jeweler or anything, there's like uh, these diamonds that they would put in to a gem tumbler. Uh, and what they would do is this gem tumbler would knock off the impurities of this diamond. But they have to put this, this compound and grit inside of it so that these diamonds don't, as they go at each other, they don't break. So the gem tumbler itself is the covenant. That is God who holds this marriage together. And that compound and grit is how you are relating to one another as you're pursuing the Lord together. And so, so I, I say all that to say this, to answer your question is how do you deal with in-laws is that you first need to know the theology of marriage, that the Lord has designed a marriage for a husband and a wife to be totally committed to each other first. Uh, Pastor Omar mentioned this, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago in, in one of his sermons, like, um, after your relationship with God, the most important earthly relationship is to your husband or to your wife. He's like, what good is it that you have a thriving marriage with your mom, yet your marriage at home is failing? And I think you got to go deeper here too, is, is the fact that you have children who are watching you. And so I have two little boys, Jeremiah and Jude, and they're watching in how I prioritize my wife over my own family. And so I think there's a practical way that we can like lean into this is if I show my family that I'm prioritizing my marriage. Like if I tell my mom and my, my, my father that Abby does come first, I help her win. Uh, and, and then even the same for Abby. If I, I go, thank you, babe. My bad. <laughs> she loves me and I love her. And even for Abby, how, how Abby can help me win is in the fact that if she is communicating to her family that our marriage is a priority first. And so I think that we are setting the example for our children and them seeing that Abby is important to me. Uh, I love my boys. I would die for my boys, but I, I need to show them the example of how important our marriage is by setting that example and leading the way in that way. Yeah, I would just add that there should always be, obviously, respect and taking care of older parents. As you know, biblic biblically, the Lord calls us to take care of our aging parents, having that love and respect, but knowing that everyone has their place. Um, and everyone has their role. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, you know, you, you guys married, uh, mentioned kids. Um and what we've seen a lot too that happens in, in marriages, especially when there's a lot of struggles going on, um, we, we hear like, well, we're just staying together for the kids. You know, because as they're going through that Tumblr, like Pastor G was saying, and like Pastor Sammy, what you're saying that in this world, um, we're, we're going to have trouble, as is considered per joy. Not if you, you know, if you have trials, but when you have trials, um, we're going when, when we go through those trials, unfortunately, um, it just does something to us, does something to our marriages uh, because our eyes are on the wrong things and we stay together uh, for the wrong reasons. And, and really it's because we, we lose love for each other. And so Pastor Omar and, and Ash, I'd love to ask you guys, if someone actually said, uh, this is that exactly what someone said. I said, I no longer feel love for him. Our children are the reason why we still live under the same roof at the same time we're a bad example for them. So what would you say to that couple that have lost love for each other? You know, I think this is this is a, a really um, hard place to be at, you know, because what happens is that marriage is, is supposed to be all about love and all these feelings. And then when you're not feeling that, you don't know what to do. You know, it's, it's very confusing. Um, but what, what I would uh, encourage this person, you know, whoever uh, is, is there's, there's two ways of kind of rekindling a love, you know, going back. First of all, um, Proverbs uh, 5.18 says, you know, rejoice in the wife of your youth. 
And I think there's so much wisdom there because it makes you go back and to think of the early days of your love, you know, of, of your, of, you know, uh, it almost encourages you to, to think back on that first time that you met each other and all those feelings. And, uh, when you started dating and you proposed and that wedding day, your wedding night, you know, the first years of marriage, uh, and those are very beautiful things to go back to and remember those things. Sometimes we, I feel like we have to go back and remember those really sweet moments and those emotions that you had, right? And so I think it's healthy for, for us to go back and rejoice and rethink and, and remember and cherish the, those, you know, them. But at the same time, the reality is, is that life changes and the little butterflies that we had at the beginning, they change, you know? And I think what happens for so many people is that they expect the rest of their life to have the same type of butterflies and the same type of love. And what happens really is that a love matures and it changes through seasons. And so what I would encourage this person is not only go back at times and think of the, 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 the wife of your, your youth or the husband of your youth, you know? But at the same time now, really cherish the person that they are now the the husband the wife the father the mother the grandmother the grand the grandfather and also start treasuring and enjoying them for who they are now because sometimes if we you know uh with the different storms of life the different seas changes of the the different things that change in life you need. To, it almost feels like as your love matures and your as your love as your life changes, your love changes as well. It changes into a new, more mature, and it you know, and you start cherishing and really treasuring the person you're with, you know. And so, I think it's important to understand that. I think the love that you the the emotions right that you feel for somebody changes at the beginning. Is a lot of infatuation when it's like oh the new no new love. And then as, as the love matures, uh, it's more of you, you start also treasuring and loving that person who they are now in this stage of life, you know, and looking at the beautiful things about them in this stage of life, you know. So I think it's both and it's, it's you know, that that back and forth. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, and it's um, it's important to remember that marriage isn't about being and staying in love. Like ultimately, God created marriage because it's, it's a display of Christ and his church. And so, you know, when we first started this marriage series, I went back and started reading a book that we read when we were engaged. And it's, uh, it's called This Momentary Marriage by John Piper. And so it's, it's important to remember that our marriage is momentary and our marriages are really only this side of heaven. And uh, there's a quote in the book that says, it's not love that sustains a marriage. Rather, it's the marriage that sustains the love. And so when you really start to take a deep look at why God and God created marriage, because he did, he created marriage. He saw in Genesis two, that it wasn't good for the man to be alone. And so he created a helper for him, a wife. And so God created marriage. He was the first dad who gave his bride to be away. And so we have to remember that it's a picture of Christ and his church. And when you really start to look and ponder on that, it's, it almost tells you that marriage is supposed to be hard a little bit and when (laughs) a lot of it and when you know when those feelings of love kind of start fading away remembering what the primary goal of our marriage is but also doing those things and falling in love it's it can look so different in every season and you can love someone so differently in every season um and I think that we do ourselves a disservice in looking back to the person that we married and and comparing um and so we need to really be able to to look at them in every season like you were saying and love them for the person that they are in each and every season. I think sometimes we can so easily look at the negative of that person in this season. And instead of just saying, you know what, what what are the beautiful things about this person in this season and like love and treasure those things, you know? So um, I think that's just something for us to consider. Yeah. Linda, you're you're on a Yeah, I was just going to say, because we... Sammy and I have been married 42 years. Come on. So how many? Young. How long say it again? 42. 42. 42. So That's it's been great. Long, we got married really young. But when, <laughs> um, you know, so to look back and to look back and remember <clears throat> those times, uh, you know, when we first got married, that was quite a while ago for us to do that. But for me, and I know for Sammy too, as we've gotten older and we've been married this long and our children have grown up and they're, they've gone and we have grandchildren, when I look at him, 
I, it's endearing to me to see him getting older because it reminds me of God's faithfulness. And it reminds me that we've been together a long time. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's comforting because I realize that we've gone through all those stages and I've got to see him get older. You know, I've got to experience that and it's a blessing. Yeah, it's beautiful. You know, with, with stages though, and, and something that Ashley and Omar were talking, they're talking about change and talking about sometimes because of time, unfortunately, if we're not, um, staying on top of our feelings, our, our character can change, our feelings change over time. And unfortunately, sometimes, uh, the spouses, they, they turn into someone that, that they shouldn't be for their spouse. They, they, they get uglies. They say things that they shouldn't. And, and I have a question that I, I want to read a verbatim is it's a, it's a person that's talking about her husband it says, uh, his sarcasm, the constant lack of respect in the relationship have brought out the worst in me as a person. I don't want to continue with him anymore. I'm out of control in front of my children. I'm the bad one now. I don't want to be with him anymore. What would you say to the person that asked this question that's really saying and pleading for help, like, I just don't know what to do? What would you just say to the person that is struggling in, in this side of the marriage? Well, you know, when, when I think of what you're just saying there, uh, one of the first things that, that comes to my mind, and it's actually something that I share when I'm doing premarital counseling with uh, couples, and, and that is um, to really be careful in how we communicate with each other. And one of the things that I, I tell them is, is that uh, remember uh, Ephesians 4, 29, because it says, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. But that talk that does come out of your mouth should be what's edifying to the person, to the hearer, or the building them up. And um, and so, because what can happen is, is we can start off, you know, you're young in your marriage and you start off and you're joking with one another and you're making fun of them or whatever. And, and it seems cute, you know, but invariably that's going to go bad because you're going to continue to do that. And pretty soon you're going to be hurting the person's feelings, which is exactly what you don't want to be doing. And so I think we have to be careful. And I, when I listen to that, that question, I, the, the thing that comes to my mind too is, is that oftentimes when a person is, when they say, you know, I don't like how my partner is treating me. One of the first things that I also share with people is, is in premarital counseling is to, the first thing you need to do is to pray for yourself. You need to ask yourself, God, what is it that maybe needs to be fixed in my own life and in my own heart that makes me resent them? Uh, but then sitting down with that person, with your spouse and, and talking about that, you know, crucial conversations aren't easy. But they, they have to be had, right? And so it's, it's necessary. That's right. So I think it's important that we do that. Th those are some of the things there. And, uh, and, a, and a change of heart, really. What do you think, Linda? When you mentioned that it was uh, in front of the children, I think is what you mentioned. That broke my heart because uh, I know Omar's been preaching about uh, how uh, the children will hear things, you know, going on. And they do need to hear some things, but they need to hear... Uh, their parents, um, they need yeah. to be modeling yeah. how to handle conflict. Yeah. So if if there there is back and forth going on, uh, you need to be mindful that they're listening. And even if they're not in the room, sometimes they're listening down the hall, you know. And so we need to be really careful how we're speaking to each other. And uh, because, uh, you know, they're going to grow up and get married one day as well. And so everything that comes out of our mouth and how we treat our spouse and speak to them. And uh, more than that, how we, um, how we have conflict resolution. We need to have godly conflict resolution and model it for them so that they're able to, um, you know, effectively have relationships in the future with not just spouses, but with coworkers and friends and, and you know, anybody in their lives, really. You know, and the last thing that that person said was, like, I don't want to be with them anymore. And, uh, it, Super sad to hear that, right? And and I would say to the, that this person that wrote that, I, I can't imagine what has happened in your life, you know, why you feel that way, some of the things that were just mentioned there. But that God, Psalm 147.3, God can heal the broken heart and binds their wounds. Man, that's what God can do for us. And so... Man, I would just, I would just ask them, yes, yes, that there's hope. There's hope 
we can never lose sight of that. And, and just ask God to help you uh, to, to change your heart, to, to restore that, like Pastor Omar was mentioning, to, to restore that, that, that joy. It's so important because God can heal that. Yeah. We have to believe that, right. that there's hope. That's great. I appreciate you sharing that. There's, there's so many things that our couples go through, that our marriages go through. Um, and we at times do feel like there is no hope, that the, the wound is too big, the pain is too much, um, the sin that was committed against us, it, it was too grave. And, and, and Pastor Omar, I'd love to ask you, you know, we got a lot of questions about uh, that kind of hurt. And one of the hurt was infidelity. Um, and, and when it comes to infidelity, it's, it, it's, it's a big wound that has hurt so many marriages. We, we said in the beginning, most of the arguments are about finances or about infidelity. And so uh, I, I just want to read some of these and, and I would love for you, if you can answer, um, can a marriage be fully restored after infidelity? Counting that both are Christian and still in love with each other and not wanting to get divorced, but humanly, there are always memories and difficulties to fully trust again the spouse. Another person said, should you ignore the enemy and not dig more if you uh, suspect that your spouse is having an affair again? So it's just there. The turmoil is there. What's going to happen? Another one is, what do you do if your spouse committed adultery, ended the affair, but now is unwilling to work toward fixing your marriage? So, Pastor, if, if you could lead us through that, that'd be great. Yeah, let me just give some 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 just general thoughts just to kind of answer all those. And listen, I... I I don't, have, I don't think I have to even say that adultery is probably, if not the deepest wound that could be inflicted in a marriage. Um, that's why there's so many warnings in scripture about staying away, right? Uh, fleeing. Uh, and there's a lot of warnings about this because of the wounds that it has. Now, I know that the Lord, the Lord knows that the wounds of infidelity are very, very deep. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that uh, he gives somebody who they've been cheated on uh, the ability to get divorced. You know, the uh, you know the scripture says allows divorce in Matthew chapter five. It says, "But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife or husband, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her makes him commit adultery." So, so there's. Because I think God understands the deep wounds and the psychological impact on a, on a person. I think he allows divorce. However, as believers in Christ, that should not be our first option. Um, our, desi our desire should be to reconcile and to restore and to rebuild the marriage. Um, uh, that should be our first inclination. You know, before we just throw in the towel, we're getting divorced. I think what would honor the Lord is that we, we try that. Let's, let's try to work through this. It's, I just understand. And, you know, this past weekend, I mean, I've seen many marriages being rebuilt after infidelity. So it's not impossible. Uh, with God's grace, all things are possible. Uh, this past weekend, um, uh, you know, I on the third week of this series, if you have not, if somebody has not watched it, I encourage you to watch it because it only gives gives the the building blocks, right, of of being able to restore mar marriage. In the even in the case of infidelity, there has to be ownership of the sins, there has to be confession, there has to be forgiveness. It has all these different things. And what I would just t tell a, a, a couple that that has gone through it, once these wounds have been inflicted, right. It's almost Im impossible to go back to the way things were before. But that doesn't mean that after God rebuilds that the next season, even though it may look a little different, it could be have its it could be beautiful in its in itself. You know, I think uh the marriage was beautiful before that happened, but after that happens, it's not like you forget it, like that never happened, but it could be it, it can be still beautiful and God could do some great things and it's amazing when when somebody really when a couple comes before the Lord broken, how God really rebuilds and God has a way of healing. Right now, um, what I would tell that person that um, that that committed adultery, I think there was a question about that person doesn't want me check in on on them to see what's going on. What I would say is that after adultery, in order to rebuild that person needs to give full access, complete and unfettered access to everything about their life. Um, and if, and what happens is that with time, 
this is, you know, I tell couples I've counseled through this. This is not about them always questioning you or nagging you or they don't trust you anymore. It's about really, it's about if you're serious about rebuilding a marriage, you need to get full access so that they could check in whenever they want. And, and every time they check in to see what's going on, they, they, every time they check in, there's a little more trust, a little more trust, a little more trust until, until a point where trust is rebuilt to a, to, to a, to a great extent. Um, but I, you know, if, if, if you're that person, right, that committed those acts, um, actions have consequences. And part of the consequences is that if you want to rebuild your marriage, you need to do whatever it takes to help your spouse rebuild their trust and their confidence in you. And I think if you allow them to happen, the guy will, will begin to, 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 you know, to, to, to rebuild and, and God does some, some amazing things, you know? Um, and so, um, I just think that that's just, that's just part of it, you know, but I, 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 can, can a marriage be rebuilt? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, and it can be real rebuilt and there could be a future without ignoring the past, but learning for the future and, and, and taking steps forward. Anything you want to add to that, Ben? No, I mean, I just adding that, you know, you've seen it, we've seen it and there's so much, there's hope. There's still hope even in these mm-hmm. situations because we've seen God do such incredible things in marriages and marriages be restored even in this church that have gone through similar trials. And so, you know, it's, there's hope. there is yeah. hope. It's possible. Praise God. Thank you for that. Uh, Pastor G. Abby, I, I would like to kind of, with that same train of thought, uh, take it to you. So how should we resolve with, uh, to be able to get over these past hurts and issues, um, things that have happened in the past, how should we resolve to be able to overcome those um, in our lives and in our marriages? Yeah, so that's a good question. I think that when it comes to resolving past hurts or like just resolving conflict in general, I think it's always wise to go back to the beginning of when you should resolve conflict. And so there's this phrase or the saying that we all know that you shouldn't go to bed angry. Uh, we say, hey, don't go to bed angry. Don't, be, you know, don't go to bed angry. We, we, we know we hear that. You probably think that a lot. Uh, but the truth is it's easier said than done, right? Because when you're in the middle of an argument or fight and you're tired, you just want to go to bed. So, but, but think about that for a minute. To not go to bed angry is like... It's like having to clean out the basement. Or we're in Miami, so we don't have a basement. Like if you have a garage <laughs> or like a clutter closet, it's like having to clean that out right before you go to bed. Bro, it, it takes time, effort, and patience. And you're thinking to yourself, I'm just tired. I want to go to bed. I've been arguing with you all day. I don't want to do this. But you know, when someone says not to go to bed angry, it's not just like practical advice. It's biblical. You know, Paul talks about this in Ephesians 4. He says, in your anger, do not sin. And then he says, don't let the sun set on your anger, allowing the devil to grab a foothold. And so you you think about that. He's admonishing couples, married couples, to not let anger fester in your heart. So the thing is, this: like if Abby and I got into an argument, we go to sleep, we don't resolve it. I could wake up the next morning and be like, oh, I'm over it. But the truth is, I'm letting that anger fester. It's unresolved. It's, It's kind of like the idea, if you're sweeping dirt under a rug, right? You know, this rug right here. If you're sweeping dirt under a rug, you can get away with it for that that moment. You can, but if you if you handle all of your conflicts by like just sweeping it under the rug, inevitably that 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 rug, that dirt that you sweep under the rug is going to become a mound and a pile to the point where you're going to trip over that when you're walking one day, and all of that dirt is exposed. Then what? And so when it come when when Paul is telling couples. You know, you have a, a rule of thumb. You have 24 hours to resolve all your conflicts. You need to do that, right? Even if it's a, it's a major conflict, like, like say infidelity, there's no way that you can solve that in 24 hours. But you're making, you're making a commitment to each other that I'm going to work on this. I'm going to go to bed angry. I'm upset. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm human, but I'm making a commitment that when I wake up the next morning, we're going to fight for our marriage. And so when it comes to resolving past hurts and conflicts, you really have to put into practice what the Lord what the Lord's word says is give yourself like a practical tool. Give your, give yourself a day. And before you go to bed, work to resolve those, those, those conflicts or issues. Can I miss another? What do you think? Yeah. Well, if you, I encourage everybody to go take a look at Ephesians four, either tonight or sometime. It's a beautiful uh, chapter and it talks about maturing in Christ and calls us to put away our former self, our former attitudes, our former way of thinking. And this applies to our relationships, but sometimes it can feel a little bit more challenging when it comes to your marriage, right? Your spouse knows you and no other way 
no human on earth knows you as well as your spouse. So whenever we argue or perhaps we sin against each other intentionally or unintentionally, it cuts and it hurts really, really deeply. It's a deeper cut because it, it, I'm sorry to cut you off. But the thing is this, is when you're arguing with the person that you love the most, they know your flaws. They know exactly where to cut you. And, and, and when Paul says, in your anger, do not sin, we always sin in our anger. Right, and so we're angry. I'm going to lash out at Abby, or I'm going to lash out at Gideon. I'm going to say something that's going to hurt them, and it cuts deep. And so, um, yeah, you're 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 resolving to 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 fight right, right. And, and what Abby always says whenever we get into an argument is that Gideon, we're not the enemy. And she's always reminding me. It's just like you know, I get overwhelmed, I get stressed, and all that stuff. Is like she's usually right, uh, and it's just a reminder <laughs> that. That Smart I, that man. she's, she's, yes, happy <laughs> wife, happy life. But, uh, that I, she's not the enemy and I'm not her enemy as well. That's right. Sorry, babe. Go. And, and not only that, it's also like pausing before you address like the issue, right? So taking a moment to think, to pray, and to remind yourself like he's not the enemy. Gather your thoughts, submit them unto the Lord, and expect the very best in your spouse. Yeah. So I would say some practical ways. Yeah. about resolving past hurts and stuff. I think we have three. Number one, we know this communication is key. Uh, when you're trying to resolve conflict, bro, no one should ever try to resolve conflict over text. It's the worst thing to do. <laughs> you know, I would encourage a face-to-face conversation. Sit down. And then as you're communicating to your spouse, um, be mindful to not assign your emotions to how, the, you know, how you're feeling and projecting it on them. I think that, you, like what Abby says, you have to take every thought captive. Be prayerful. Be mindful of how you're communicating to your spouse. And, and Scripture talks about when you are communicating, especially to correct, you're communicating to, not to condemn, but to restore. And if I truly, truly do love my spouse the way that I should love my spouse, I'm communicating correction to her and the way to restore our marriage, the way to restore our love for each other, if you will. Our love shouldn't go away, but to restore our marriage in that way. Yeah, and then the second piece would be to listen, right? Listen to the other person's perspective and where they're coming from with the goal of trying to understand where they're coming from. Because sometimes we listen here, but we're not listening here. Hello. While they're talking, we're preparing our rebuttal, getting ready to hit them. Or, <laughs> or <laughs> what? Not hit them. I don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> yeah, that out. She'll, she'll, she'll knock, she'll knock you out. <laughs> she'll knock me out. She'll turn her ring around like, yeah. <laughs> That was funny. Okay. And the next thing I would add, it's a really important to listen to the other person's perspective, right? To understand where they're coming from. And sometimes we are listening here and we're not listening here. As they're talking, we're creating our next rebuttal and how we're going to go at them. And so um, it's important not to do that and to actively try to listen and hear out where they're coming from. And then the second part to that was to accept and to seek forgiveness as Christ has forgave us here in Ephesians. It talks about it and reminds us to be kind and forgiving just as God is kind and forgiving to us through 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 Christ. Yeah, and then lastly, if you can't get over an unresolved hurt, then seek help. Find somebody that you trust. Ask for someone who, 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 who you know loves God, loves the Lord, and can speak objectively into your marriage and, and be able to hold you and your spouse accountable in that way. So Yeah. Um, I, I'm actually going to go back to that seeking help because I, I, I think I have something there. But, you know, unfortunately, there's so many of our couples that don't seek help. And they think that they, they are the enemy. Each other are the enemy. And they get to the point where they haven't sought out help. And, and so when they run to the pa- church, they run to the pastor, they run to the leader, it's almost like too late. Uh, as Pastor, you, you were saying that in your message and, and it was an eye-opening thing because it happens so many times where they don't talk to anybody and now we're, we're at the last straw. And so many questions came in about divorce. So many questions. It was a, a little overwhelming to read the list, uh, but the reality is that's where many of our couples are. So Pastor Omar and Ashley, I would love to ask you guys, you know, um, if your spouse is not willing to work things out, when, when do you know, like when to quit? You know, there, uh, somebody else asked, is it okay, uh, for God to say yes to divorce? Can I divorce my husband for cheating and all the above abuse? He refused to go to therapy at first and after months being separated, he denies all of it happening and uses God against me and says, I submitted to the devil because I filed for divorce. Um, there's so much pain and hurt. And so people want to know, like, what do they do when would they feel like there's nothing left to do but divorce? <clears throat> yeah, this is another heavy topic. Um, you know, I, I come from a divorced parents. Um, and so I know the the realities of 
the impact that it has on both parents, on both people. And also I've lived the realities that children have to endure uh, through a divorce. Uh, what I will tell people, I always tell people is that you think divorce is going to bring you so much joy and relief. And there's also a lot of sadness and brokenness on the other side of divorce. And so a lot of people think, I just got to get out of this marriage. I got to find relief. This is my way out. And they find out then the other side, it's not that, you know? And so um, I think I always like to remind people of that because the enemy could really play with people's minds and when it comes to divorce. Um, when we look at scripture, there's only two moments, clear moments where God allows divorce. One of them is infidelity, that he allows it, if that's like the last circumstance, and I covered that in the la previous question. And the other one that many people do not talk about is the uh, abandonment by a non-believer. Uh, and that is uh, a circumstance, for example, where two people, uh, it's very unique, uh, two people are not believers, uh, one of them becomes a believer and the other person who does not become a believer doesn't agree with it, hates the fact that now they're following Christ and wants to divorce them. Uh, at that juncture, I think you're, you're called to, to, to fight for that marriage. But if they choose to walk away from the marriage, God says, let them go. So for example, in first Corinthians chapter seven, it says, but if under this circumstance, but if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. So again, if the person after coming to Christ is attacking you and is wants to get out and it's, I, I didn't sign up for this and I'm fighting for divorce, obviously you fight for that marriage. But if they decide to walk away, then God is allowing them, allowing you and freeing you from that if, if that's the, the direction they take. But nevertheless, I always tell people, uh, whether it's in this type of situation or any or, or any or any situation, it's interesting to know that in both infidelity or in this very unique circumstance, right, uh, that that scripture never encourages divorce uh, uh, or is or requires divorce. It only allows it as a last resort. You know, I think it's important to understand. It never encourages it, and it never requires it. It only allows it if if. There's no other way to fi fix the marriage, right? And what I always tell people, uh, oh, she's, you know, he's threatening for divorce or she's threatening for divorce. What I always tell people is you stand your ground and you fight for your marriage. And if they pursue divorce and through the legal system, let it be that when you get a divorce is because they went through the course and you have no other choice legally but to take that step. But you need to fight for your marriage and if it ever comes to a point that they fight so much for a divorce that you have no choice, then at least you can walk away from that marriage with a clear conscience that you did everything possible to fight for that marriage, you know? Um, but I want to also, you know, remind people that other than those, the main one is infidelity and the other one is that unique circumstance of two people, with, you know, that become a believer and one doesn't, they walk away. It's important for people to understand that no one in scripture does God allow divorce for any other reason. So changes of emotions, changes of feelings, fighting, arguing, all these things are things that marriages go through. And that's part of sanctifications, part of honoring the Lord. And those are not reasons that God allows you to get a divorce. Now, I know there's a lot of people who say, but what about if the other person is being abusive? physically, uh, my children are in danger, all these crazy scenarios. And those are very scary situations. Uh, what I would recommend at that point is separation. You got to separate. God has not called you to be in an unsafe environment. God has not called you to be, you know, put your, your life at risk. You got to separate themselves and you move out. Um, uh, but I always tell the, the people, you know, I, I think that's the first step for someone in the circumstances so that they're, they're safe, you know, and then submit to the Lord and Lord work in this situation, you know, and, and, and fight for your marriage in those specific things. And I would encourage somebody who's going through those situations, they need to seek out pastoral help and help me process this. You know, once you separate and you, you gain distance, so you're physically safe, start praying, Lord, change hearts, Lord, do something here, like, you know, and, and start seeking, seeking help. In cases where there's a lot of fighting, you know, I have couples that 
they're just so fighting it and it's there's so much hurt and one party just wants to separate i'm i don't always recommend separation just for the sake of se separation but if they do separate it has to be with the mentality we're gonna take a, a break in order to reconcile it can yeah and, and to come back together because unfortunately for so many people think well separations is one step towards divorce it makes the divorce easier what i always tell if you're gonna take that step i don't recommend it but if you're gonna do this my encouragement is that for you to do so with a mentality, we're going to heal in order to reconcile. And that has to be the objective. That's a key. The objective of the separation um, is to eventually reconcile and fight for this and fight for that marriage. If, a, if for whatever reason a marriage gets, the, the people get divorced and, and they, um, you know, I think one of the questions was if I get remarried, right? Am I constantly living in adultery? Well, what I would just say, listen, I can't speak to every situation, but if two people divorce and the way it works out is that they eventually re, uh, remarry somebody else. What I will say is don't now get divorced to try to reconcile back to that old marriage. Now try to honor the Lord, learn from your past mistakes from, from the past relationship and now seek to honor the Lord in the marriage that you're in right now. Does that make sense? And so move forward with where you're at right now and seek to honor the Lord with the new commitment, the new covenant that you're in with, with that person, right? Because um, then it gets crazy. He's trying to go back, go back and forth. Um, so that that's, that's what I would say. And then the other thing is, I think a lot of people who, when they become single, they keep living in shame. In fact, I, I know that there's probably a lot of people out that were, have gone through this marriage series and listening for, you know, me, fight for your marriage, fight for your marriage, that their marriage dissolved and, you know, just broke. And now they're living in shame. If you feel shame, I would, this is what I would tell people, that's not God. That's the, that's the enemy trying to shame you. Now, if in this marriage series, you hear something like, you feel convicted, like, wow, I messed up in that area. That's, conviction is good and for you to learn for the future to, you know, to change in a future relationship, you know, to, to, to handle things differently. But if you're single, single dad, single mom, if you're feeling shame, that's from the enemy. And so there has to be a moment that this is not from God. You know, after you ask for forgiveness, you go before the Lord broken, the Lord forgives and there's grace and mercy, but you should not now be living in constant shame. And I would just say, if if there's things that kind of like you learn from this and you feel convicted, okay, that's from God. Conviction comes from God. Shame comes from Satan, right? If you felt convicted in this series, okay, you learn. Now in the next relationship, in the future marriage, if that's where the God leads you, now you can put all these things that you're learning into practice and what you've learned from past relationships. So I know I covered a lot, but hopefully that kind of just... Yeah you know, lays the ground for people who have the right concept, yeah. concept of divorce. Hey, you're, you're yeah, so I was, was going to say, Pastor Omar, what you said, that last thing, I know that I've spoken with people that are single and I've tried to remind them that that doesn't define them. That's in their past, but it doesn't define them. So. That's, right. That's great. And, and Pastor, thank you. It's such a big topic and we got an overwhelming amount of, of questions. So thank you for taking your time to that. You know, one of the things that you're talking about is, is also um, before you dissolve, like you want to resolve, there needs to be an end goal. And so uh, Pastor Gideon, actually going back to something that you said, you know, hopefully in, in that season of trying to resolve, trying to bring it back together, um, there are some couples, some marriages where one wants to seek out help they want to seek out counsel, but the other doesn't. They, they just, they're worried about their image. They're worried about how, you know, people will perceive them. Oh, we need to ask for help. And so what would you guys say to the person that someone wants to look out and seek for counsel, seek for help, but the other person says, oh, I don't want people to know what we're going through. Yeah, yeah. So it's safe to say, you know, it's important for one person and perhaps it's not like the priority of the other person. And so you always want to ask yourself, because in the question, it says that they're concerned about their image, right? Like why? I think it's important to always get down to the root of why, you know, it's pride, the one of the bigger reasons of it. But in that question, perhaps, you know, maybe there's been an opportunity 
maybe there has been an instance where you've talked bad about your spouse and they that's why they don't want to go to counseling. You have to really be honest with yourself and ask yourself, well, where is this coming from? And then also to be honest with yourself, because if you are speaking bad about your other spouse and their person, it could be very ostracizing to want to go to counseling, knowing what awaits you and, and, and how it could go down. Yeah, the truth is like, like if, if Abby were to speak poorly of me to her family, anytime that I would walk into like a family event, I'm already walking in at a deficit. I feel like, bro, I got to prove myself to these people as well. And so I'm like thinking to myself, I, I don't want, I don't want any help. But I think Abby brought up something about pride. And so the question talks about, you know, my spouse is more concerned about our image uh, than getting help. I think you have to acknowledge that it's a hard issue. You have to acknowledge that the root of that is pride. Um, and so if you are more concerned about the image of your marriage than the health of your marriage, well, that's a deep, deep issue there. Um, there is a... His name is Jason Meyer. He, he writes, uh, he wrote on marriage, but he, there's this quote that he writes. He talks about pride. He says, pride isn't just sin. It's a sinful mother that, that produces or births other sins. And when I read that, I'm thinking, like, yeah, of course, we know that pride is at the root of everything. But, but how, what pride, like, for instance, if, take for instance a lie. If you lie, at the root of that is pride because you're lying because you're too prideful to admit that you are wrong. So pride doesn't just tell lies. Pride is the lie. And so if you're believing the lie that it's more important that people look at my marriage as it being healthy than it actually being healthy, it's a prideful thing. It's, a, it, it's an issue of your heart. And so I think if they're asking the question, like, how do you address this? You always have to go back to God's word. Like, we're a church. We're pastors. We're not going to deviate from that. You have to. Like, how do you tackle a hardened, prideful heart? It's by pursuing Christ over and over and over again. And so if you're the spouse who desires like, you know, counsel from an, uh, from like a pastor or a wellspring or whatever it may be, pray for your spouse. Pray that the Lord will soften their heart uh, to realizing, to, to come to humility, to be able to understand and realize like, I really do need help. And then also, I think you should check yourself and how you might, like what Abby said, how you might be speaking to your spouse. Perhaps there's something that you're doing that's just pushing them further away of like, this is the reason why I don't want to get help. Because you're going to ostracize me. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. You're bad mouthing me to your family, to your friends. Like, why do I want that? You know? Um, and then I think that, you know, pray like the God's grace is sufficient for you, for your spouse who doesn't want help and ask for the Lord to intervene. I would start there. And I think that as you're praying for your spouse, that the Lord would soften their heart to be able to get to help, pray for your own heart as well. Uh, and then just pray that, pray for this whole situation. I would say that. What do you think? Yeah. And I would just add that on the flip side of pride, it's humility. And we know that humility leads us on a road to grace and pride leads us on the road to opposition. And so scripture calls us to, uh, well, scripture says that God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. And so we see that all throughout scripture as a beautiful example as to what we should try to emulate. Did that answer the question? <laughs> that did. That definitely did. And, you know, we, we talked about so many struggles and, and things throughout um, marriage, whether it's infidelity, arguments, discussions, uh, talked about divorce. But there are some couples that as they're dealing with pride, as they're dealing with different things, they actually make it, well, let's go like that, make it um, through where their kids are now moved out of the house. And now a, a lot of people feel like they, they're together because of the kids, for them to stay together. We made it, our kids are out of the house, but now it's just two roommates. And you know, one of the things that, yeah, that you guys said earlier, you've been married 42 years, you have kids that have kids, you guys are grandparents, and so I, I would love to ask you, there's a question, you know, what do we do now that the kids are gone? How do maybe the, the couples that they feel like they've just been putting all their attention into the kids and they've been kind of neglecting the arguments, you know, and, and their marriage is kind of dwindling. How do they rekindle their marriage and their love again? Start. Yeah, I'll start. I'll start. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm going to address the question, but prior to getting to that point, I think it's important that as you're raising your kids that you don't make them idols in the marriage in the first place where they're sucking up every single amount of energy in the household that you need to make time for each other as you're raising your children. Love your children, prioritize your children, but also uh, make time for your marriage as well. Because as you, when you do get to that age and when your kids do leave, if you haven't, um, developed that and nourish that relationship all through those years, then I, I, you will look at each other and kind of say, 
you know, who, who are you? You know, who are wow. you? Because you've been spending so much time taking the kids here, taking the kids there, and, and focusing on them so much. And so I would say, first of all, do that if you're not already there. And when you are at that point, to be intentional with your time. It's a good chapter. It's not a bad chapter. It's like, it's awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. And because we've raised our kids and we the grandkids are there, they come, they go. We have our time. I, I love it. I love this chapter in our life. And and we go on dates. We're going to go on a get, date tonight. Come on now. <laughs> yeah. And it's so, late. Yeah. It's late. Party after this? I know. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, you know, just be really intentional in uh, your relationship after your kids are all grown and gone and making those um, decisions together, we're going to do this. We're, you know, share with each other, uh, rekindle that friendship, that love that you had. And like Omar was talking about, uh, don't forget, no matter how long it's been, don't forget yeah. that when you first met, how you felt, you fell in love with that person. And now you get to spend most of your time with that person. Come on now. It's okay. good. So when the, when I saw the question, I started thinking, Really, why why do couples, when they get to that place, why do they feel like they're strangers? You know, why why all of a sudden do they feel like who is this person? And really, it's because of time, which which she mentioned. It's it's the time. If you do the work on the front end, where you encourage one another, you know, where where you value that person, because children are. Uh, are an addition to your life. They're not your life. They're an addition to it. And so doing things, being proactive and doing things with your spouse, uh, without the kids, it's important. And I know it's hard, but it's important. So when that time comes. And so what I decided to do is I would take the word time and make it an acronym and use it as an acronym. So, so the first T or the first letter in time is T and that's talk. Make sure that you're talking to your spouse. Super important. And I think you guys, uh, get, um, Abby and Gideon, you were saying, uh, you know, listening, really listening. And, and something that I'm not really good at, but I try to be better at is listen to hear, not to respond. Meaning when you're listening to someone, don't try to already say what you want to answer, but really listen to the, to the, to the, to the conversation fully. And so that way you can respond, you know, properly. And then with, with the I is initiate new traditions, initiate new adventures. The kids are gone. Now there's some other things that you can do. So, so, you know, go with it. Try, try some new adventures. And then the M should be to manage, manage your expectations. Because if we see other couples, then we look at our own lives and we're like, oh, we're supposed to be like them. No, 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 that's them. So manage your expectations, super important. And then the E in time, encourage. Make sure that you're constantly encouraging your spouse, uh, really encouraging, not just trying to like, well, you're awesome, but really, really encourage them. <laughs> Be specific yeah. in the way you're encouraging them. You know, some of those things. Anyways. Awesome. I yeah. love it. Pastor. Thank you so much. That's a, a lot of wisdom. A, a, a few things also that I share couples, and I think it, it can apply to couples who feel like empty nesters that don't know each other, or even after... Um, like uh, whether it's infidelity or like a really bad part of their marriage is uh, I, I, you know, I, I think in in their in that case of empty nesters, number one, celebrate what you've accomplished. You've raised your children, that's great. right? That's awesome. You know, that's Praise that's a God. great thing. <laughs> and what I tell people always is, they put too much pressure. Kind of like what Sammy was saying is like, okay, now like let's get all romantic. And sometimes like, there's no feelings to be romantic, you know. And so the first step is is man, just be friends again. And just just be friends. And then all those feelings are going to start, you know, coming, you know, celebrate the fact that you're empty nesters, start off as friends, go out, hang out, talk without the pressure of like, hey, after this, you know, we're going to get back home. Like, you know, all, <laughs> because a lot of people feel like that pressure, man, right. just be friends, just be friends. And little by little, once you start developing that friendship again, and then all those little things start coming back, start coming into place, you know, but celebrate, be friends, and they just let the natural course you know, from that point on. Yeah, I love it. You my friend? Thank you guys. My friend. She's good? My friend. You're your friend? You guys are friends? Your I was friend? just making sure that she was my friend. <laughs> well, hey, uh, a legit question. I'm, I want to end with this one. It came in and it was pretty, pretty serious. You guys ready? I'm going to actually ask Linda and uh, Ashley. This is a real question. I am not lying to anybody. This is a real question right now. How do you deal <laughs> married to a Puerto Rican? 
<laughs> How are you doing? Right. 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 So you're married to Puerto Rican. Yeah, Ashley. Sammy and, and I are, are Puerto Rican. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, how, how do you? We're, I, I'm you a Puerto Rican. Yeah. What, what, what would be, what would be your me. answer? What would be your answer? I, I, I think it's awesome. It's the best. Puerto Ricans are the best. <laughs> She's That's really about to go in awesome. and answer this question. Like, hey, okay, you really got to deal with this. Cool. The majority of my Cuban family has married Puerto Ricans. And so, yeah. There like, you go. My brother married a Puerto Rican. I married a Puerto Rican. So there must be something in the water. Something in the water. Something in the water. What would you say? Well, she's Mexican and I'm Samoan, so we're confused. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm Ecuadorian, so it doesn't apply anyways. But hey, thank you so much uh, for being here. Thank you for your time. And just to kind of like really, really wrap things down, um, is there anything that maybe you still have on your heart, maybe uh, an advice, a counsel, very, really quick that you'd love to share with those that are listening to today that maybe we weren't able to ask yet or you just have it on your heart tip on your tongue you want to share I think I think Abby's ready yeah I would say like at the start you know for the past three weeks we've really drilled in on our marriage and I think we've shared a lot of um things that we could do better but I think it's also um we also have to couple it with the things that they're doing well like that encouragement constant you know feedback and encouragement so that they know that they're doing a really good job. And um, babe, I think you should share what you always share in small group with about your advice. Love Jesus. Which one? Oh, the mayor. Oh, yeah. It's a, one that I, I would often say is that um, loving Jesus more than you love your spouse is the only time coming second really puts you first. And you will never, ever lose out if you have a spouse who loves Jesus more than you. Never. And I think the the encouragement there is that I think if you both love Jesus more than you love each other, um, the overflow, the outcome of that, the result of that is like God will give you a heart and a desire for your spouse even more so. And so, um, yeah, I would just encourage each other to, like what Abby's saying, encourage each other along the way of, of, of communing with God daily, pursuing the Lord as often as you can. That's good. Yeah. Anybody else want to share? Um, I piggyback a little bit off of Sammy. I mean, to your point, Gideon, yes, like seeking first the kingdom always and all else will be added. And, you know, he was sharing about piling up dust under a rug, like divorce and these things. They're, they don't happen overnight, right? It's all the little moments. And so kind of like what you were sharing about being empty nesters, like be intentional in the time we have now. Date your spouse. Date your spouse and be intentional. In the, and, and, you know, that's something that we've been really big on is carving out that time without the kids now. And, you know, we have a five and two-year-old. It's hard. It takes <laughs> <Amen>. time. <laughs> but carving out that time now and making sure that we do put each other second, but put each other before the kids and before other things. Because I have to live with you after the kids are gone. And we have to like each other. <laughs> I think for me, just quick advice is... is um. It's easy when we're stressed and when there's like a lot of ish things going on to be critical of the other person and start nitpicking the little, the little things that they do that are, oh, look how terrible they are. They did, did this or they didn't they do this, you know, little, little, and instead, yeah, the toilet, you know, all these little details, you know, <laughs> toilet paper. and I think what happens, we get into a marriage, in a marriage, we get so critical of each other. I think what, that's what the enemy wants. Be critical of them. Look at the little, little things that they're not doing or they're doing. I think what God wants us to do is, man, treasure all the all the the great things about them, you know, and focus more on like, man, what a blessing they are! Wow, look how look how they are doing with, with their children. Look how they do at work. Look how they do all these different cool things. Look how, and, and I think if you start focusing more on the blessings that the blessing they are to you from God instead of like the little being o- overly critical about the the dumb stuff that doesn't really matter, I think it changes your your view of life, your, your, the view of your spouse, your perspective in a day to day, you know? I would say just always that there's always hope. Just be hopeful in your marriage. God ordained marriage, you know? And so there's always hope. And I think probably for me, it's just always consider the other person above yourself. When you look at Philippians two, just talk so much about humility and Man, just consider the other person above yourself, uh, and 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 I think you'll put yourself in a good position. So. Thank you so much, family. Thank you so much. I personally have have received so much from this conversation, and I know that everybody watching at home as well. And so, uh, thank you for joining us today. We 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 hope that you had a, a great evening uh, listening to this beautiful conversation. And uh, I want to encourage you. Something that our church is doing, we having a marriage seminar, and it's happening. Um, April 19th and 20th. It's going to be an absolutely incredible experience here at our Palmetto Bay campus. We still have a couple spots left, and so we want to encourage you to 
make, do everything possible to be here. Um, there's, there's a little cost, but it's going to be able to provide for the materials and the resources, the food that we're going to be able to provide. But we really want to urge you to be here. It's going to be a, an absolute great time. And so I want to make sure that you guys are here. But also, Wanted to honor you, Pastor. Uh, thank you because we were uh, in, in going in a different direction. We were going to do something different, but uh, the Spirit of God spoke to you clearly and just prompted your spirit to say, you know what? We need to stop what we're doing and we need to preach to our marriages. And so, Pastor, in front of our entire congregation, those watching, thank you for being sensitive to the Spirit of God. Um, and honestly, you're doing such an incredible job leading us. Uh, we're, uh, uh, the, the men are staff here at this church and and uh, Ashley also leading Caring for Miami and, and we're we're honored to be led by you um, and, and Pastor G for, for your team as well and all the execution that it takes to pivot and to do something else. So um, Pastor Sammy, uh, the way that you just welcome us uh, into this church and our campus and ladies, um, we, we can't do it if, if you're not next to us. We, we cannot do it without uh, strong women by our side. And so thank you for how you help us um, in so many areas. And so thank you. Thank you. We, we appreciate you guys so much. So we love you guys. We pray that you're blessed and we'll see you very soon. 